following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In the Greek mysteries, we hear about uh, many gods and goddesses. And as we always remind you in the Gnostic tradition, the gods and goddesses are symbolic. They represent forces and intelligences that operate in nature. It's a, a mistake for us to study the scriptures and mythologies of any tradition and study them literally. To read about the gods, the heroes, as if literally they are a person. Or literally lived the stories and experiences that are related in the mythologies. All of these myths and stories encode symbolic truths. So in the Greek mysteries, one of the core symbols is Gaia, or Gay, which is the name of the Divine Mother. Gaia is Mother Nature, or the planet Earth. And this symbol has a deep spiritual significance with many levels of meaning. Gaia does not merely represent the literal physical planet. Gaia represents forces of nature, laws, and intelligences that function in every level of the cosmos. And for those of us who have a serious interest in spiritual advancement and spiritual development, this symbol holds a particular importance because Gaia is the one who aids us helps us, guides us, and provides us with everything that we need in order to achieve our goal of spiritual development. Gaia is our Divine Mother. Unfortunately, humanity has forgotten its mother. We in this so-called modern age have the point of view that we are self-originated. <clears throat> we have this characteristic now in our culture that we are above nature, that we are beyond nature. And we carry ourselves and live our daily lives as though we don't need nature. Somehow we have come to this point of our history 
of our civilization where we trample nature. In fact, we tend to avoid it. And when we study our day-to-day -day existence, we can see that <clears throat> humankind on this planet has steadily been distancing itself from its mother. When we see our so-called advanced civilization with our so-called advanced technology, the further we go, the more we supposedly increase our advancement, we are also increasing our distance from our mother. Nowadays, <clears throat> it is rare for us to touch the earth, to touch the dirt, to be conscious of the air that we breathe. Nowadays, we are surrounded at all times by synthetic things. We never touch nature. What we wear, what we clothe ourselves with, what we sit on, everything is manufactured in factories. When do we touch the earth, the soil, the plants, the grass? As across this planet, we see in every country, humanity no longer can survive in nature. Nowadays, in order for a human being, what we call a human being, to exist, a human being cannot farm, cannot nourish the earth, cannot raise animals, and live. Nowadays, for a human being to support themselves and their family, they have to leave nature and live in the city. And that's why we see across the entire planet the cities expanding and the expanses of nature emptying of people. The smaller towns, the rural areas, the populations are going down steadily. In the cities, the populations are going up. And in the cities, what we see is every surface being covered with concrete and metal and glass, things that are hard, synthetic, manufactured. We don't touch the earth. We clothe ourselves with synthetic things. We always ride in cars and hang out in shopping malls and offices with nothing living around us surrounded by dead things, clothed with dead things. Our homes are filled with dead things. Plastics and metals, synthetic chemicals. And we think this is progress. We think this is normal. But the consequences of it are becoming visible everywhere. Gaia, the mother goddess, represents the forces of nature that give rise to all life. Everything that is alive comes from her. In the ancient Orphic hymns, we find a beautiful hymn written to Gaia, and I'll read it to you. This hymn is about 2,300 years old. It says, O Mother Gaia, of gods and men the source, endured, endowed with fertile, all-destroying force, all-parent bounding, whose prolific powers produce a store of beauteous fruits and flowers, all various made, the immortal world's strong base, eternal, blessed, crowned with every grace, from whose wide womb, as from an endless root, Fruits many formed, mature, and graceful shoot. Deep bosom, blessed, pleased with grassy plains, sweet to the smell and with prolific rains. All flowery diamond, center of the world, 
Around thy orb the beauteous stars are hurled with rapid whirl, eternal and divine, whose frames with matchless skill and wisdom shine. Come, blessed goddess, listen to my prayer, and make increase of fruits thy constant care. With fertile seasons in thy train draw near, and with propitious mind thy supplicants hear. So in the Greek mythology, Gaia represents nature. Not a person, but nature as a whole. But you see, nature is an intelligence. Nature is not stupid. Nature is extremely complicated and very beautiful and terrifying. Nature is a force that is far beyond our comprehension. As proud as we are of our civilization and our accomplishments, we scarcely understand nature. We don't even understand the nature of our bodies. We barely understand what it means to be alive. So that scripture, the very first section of it, says that Gaia is the source of men and gods. And that's because everything living on every level of nature comes from the Divine Mother. Without exception. Even the gods. Every living creature, from the smallest particle to the biggest universe, is all merely a part of her body. And this is part of what we need to grasp, is the incredible complexity of the Divine Mother. We talk about Gaia as the planet, Earth. And this is true and relevant. But Gaia is also Prakriti, which is the womb of space. It is existence. The Divine Mother is matter and energy. In fact, her name in Latin or Greek, those ancient languages, is Mater, which is where we get the word matter. And the most ancient word in most every language is also the first word that we say, ma, ma. This is true all around the planet. We all say that for our mother, ma. This, this is mater, mother, Mary, Maria, ma. In the Asian cultures, in Hinduism, in India, and in China, and in Tibet, <clears throat> Ma is ama. So this word is universal. The mother. And so the mother is the presence of this divine creative force in all things. Just as we have a physical mother, a humanoid mother, the planet is our mother. The solar system is our mother. This galaxy is our mother. The universe is our mother. The mother, the cosmic mother, has many levels. Moreover, and probably most importantly, we have our own individual divine mother. That confluence of forces in nature, a condensation of the cosmic mother related to our specific ray, in other words, our innermost being as goddess. She is our mother, our own Gaia. She is the one who from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime to lifetime for uncountable ages has given us life. Not only in this humanoid form, but in every form we've had. We have a divine mother who is the same one for eternity. And yet, who among us has seen her face or knows her name, has smelled her scent, has heard her laugh or heard her cry? We have, but we have forgotten because we have our consciousness asleep. 
Our own individual Divine Mother is a particularized aspect of the Cosmic Mother. In the same way that our ray, our innermost being, is a particularized aspect of the cosmic being. The drop of water is but part of the ocean. In the same way, our being, our Divine Mother, is a portion of the universal aspect. There is a relationship. There is unity and multiplicity. There is identity and there is the communal aspect. We need to understand these distinctions so we don't get confused. Ages ago, when life particularized itself into this planet we call Earth, Gaia, the Divine Mother, organized nature in her womb, and this planet was born. And this planet is also a Divine Mother born from its own mother. And on this planet Earth, we find abundant life, hugely complex, far beyond our comprehension, with many, many levels of life. Not only physical levels, but multidimensional levels. All of that existence is a vast system that is highly organized and has a specific purpose and goal about which we have no idea. We've come to the stage of our civilization where we think nature exists just to please us. That nature is just our sandbox here for us to use or destroy as we will. And again, the evidence for this is everywhere. But as a fact, nature has a purpose, it has a function. It isn't just a random accident in nature. The planet has a function, has a purpose, and so does every creature on it. Everything is organized, but beyond our vision, beyond our sight. The physical aspect of the earth is only one aspect. What we see in the physical aspect is the third dimension. The physical aspect is the newest part. The physical planet, that which exists in the third dimension, has not been here very long relative to cosmic time. It's relatively new. That's millions of years to you and me, which seems like a long time. But in the time scale of the Divine Mother, it's not much. Previous to the planet being in the third dimension, it was in the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and beyond. When we study the Tree of Life, the Kabbalah, we see that the Sephiroth descend in a scale of increasing density. And those Sephiroth represent how energy descends and crystallizes into matter and gradually becomes denser. So as the energy descends from the womb of the Divine Mother, it becomes more and more dense and more and more complex. Past ages, this Earth was only in the fifth dimension. And then it moved into the fourth dimension, which is called Eden. And then from Eden, it crystallized into the physical world. This is over unthinkable measures of time. Measures of time that we can scarcely comprehend. But that crystallization of matter and energy all serves as a vehicle, vessels that channel forces. You see, when we study how the energy descends down the tree of life, down through multidimensionality, we see that the purpose of that 
is so that the descending ray of consciousness can know itself. That ray descends into greater degrees of complexity in order to manage more and more complicated laws, in order to gain wisdom. So that having reached that limit, it returns back upwards, wiser, developed, having accomplished something. The purpose of that descent and ascent is for that primordial virginal spark of consciousness which emerges from the Ainsof, the Absolute, or the Prakriti, to descend into nature, to perfect itself, and to become an angel, to become a god. This means that that ray of light descends from above into the abyss, is born as a god, and rises back up. This is the universal cosmic drama of every religion. This is the story of Christus, Christ, Baldur, Thor, Odin, Heracles, Apollo, all the great gods in all their unique ways represent this myth of how a spark of consciousness descends into a shell, into an embryo to be born, to die, to resurrect, to become another sun, another star, another universe according to its level. So what we see then in nature are waves and waves of sparks emerging out of the absolute, like the waves of a great ocean. But those waves are coming out of the womb of the Divine Mother. They are waves of life, spontaneously bursting forth from Gaia's cosmic body. And those life sparks crystallize into matter and emerge as minerals. Scientists have not yet admitted life off of this planet, <clears throat> but they have admitted minerals. But they haven't really brought together different avenues of their modern science, the quantum and the physical. Physical scientists or astrophysicists who study extraterrestrial planets and cosmic bodies readily admit that there is an abundance of mineral life in the universe. That, in fact, the universe teems with it. Minerals, all types of elements, everywhere. But those materialistic physicists or scientists have not yet understood what the quantum mechanics have been saying and what spiritual physicists have been saying for centuries, which is every particle is alive. Every particle has life. Every existing thing has matter has energy and has consciousness. Everything. In its level. So all of those minerals throughout space have inside of them a spark of living substance. It is not the same substance as a plant or an animal or a human being. But it is nonetheless a fire that gives that, that element energy, power. That energy inside any element is its life force. It is consciousness. Every single particle. Now, if we look at our planet, to us it seems quite big, a huge mass, and by far most of it is minerals. Only a very thin skin on its surface has other kinds of life. But all of those minerals are life forms bursting out of that cosmic mother that are working in hierarchies. Now grasp this. The physical element is just a shell. Iron, sulfur, any kind of rock, any kind of crystal, gold, silver, all the metals, they are just physical shells through which consciousness enters and leaves. Just like us. Our bodies are born and die. Minerals are born and die. But in a different time scale from us. Very different. Minerals are alive. They are hosting the consciousness of very 
beginner souls. Extremely simple. Without mind the way we think of mind. And in ancient times, long time ago, when humanity was not so dense, we could see them. And we called them dwarves, gnomes, pygmies, leprechauns, different names for these little creatures that would inhabit certain types of elements. Little by little, over many, many ages and many, many stages of development, those souls learn. They grow, they develop, they advance. Not the body, not the material element, the soul, the consciousness, the energy that's in that body. And little by little, they advance. And that's why there are hierarchies in metals, so many elements that we've already begun to map in science. From very simple elements to very heavy elements. Those represent the range of which those sparks of consciousness are elevating themselves in their intelligence. And the most valuable metals in terms of nature's value are the ones that are the most advanced. A diamond, for example, is relatively rare, but an advanced mineral. Gold as well. Silver. Different metals, different elements that represent an ascension through the hierarchies of that level of nature. They have power. They have energy. And that's why we harvest them and use them. Because of the energy inside of them. And certain elements have more energy than others. And we know this. In fact, we can't live without them. We drink water. We eat food to get those minerals, the elements, in our bodies. This is the basis of life. This is why the minerals, the earth, is called the body of the mother. The milk that nourishes us comes from that. The mother's milk. It is the oceans. It is the gases. It is all the elements in nature that sustain our very existence. But all of those elements, all of those atoms are alive. They're living. And yet we treat them as though they are nothing. And this is a demonstration of our profound ignorance. You see, our ancient ancestors and some modern natives still remember that the earth is sacred. The earth is our mother. The earth should be treated with respect. We don't have the right to go around raping our mother. And yet we do it. All of us have been witness the last few weeks of what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a terrible crime against the planet. What is the extraction of oil? It is sucking the life blood out of the planet. Just as our physical body has blood, so does the planet. That blood is oil. We have punctured a hole in the body of the earth, and the earth is bleeding. Why have we done that? Well, we like to blame the big corporations and the governments for it. But the only reason they're doing it is because we want to drive our cars. We want to buy more plastic. We want the things that that oil makes. It's our fault. The companies are only doing it because we're paying them to do it. We, as a humanity, are raping the earth. Not them, not the other people, it is us. We need to take that seriously and recognize the fact of it. So all the minerals on the planet contain that essence of the Divine Mother, the life force. And in that life force, we see the evolution of conscious sparks that are moving through those kingdoms of all the different types of minerals. And when any essence, a consciousness, that spark of intelligence gains enough knowledge in that kingdom, it's granted the right to graduate, to be initiated into a new kingdom, the plant kingdom. What emerges out of the soil? 
a superior life, a more complex life. A life that needs that soil, the minerals, to sustain itself, but it goes on to build something even greater. There are not as many plants as there are minerals. There aren't as many souls that are advanced into that level. But there are a lot of plants and forms of life that belong to the plant kingdom. <clears throat> And what happens here is these superior forms of physical bodies house sparks of consciousness that are more advanced than minerals. And those sparks of consciousness use their physical bodies in plants to take minerals and transform them in their bodies. You see, plants take from the mineral kingdom, from the water, from the air, from the soil, and take those elements and transform them and create new life. Beautiful life. Without the plants, we wouldn't live. Without plants, there'd be no humanity. Likewise, without the minerals. We need them. So we see subsequently that plants, the souls of plants who develop themselves, graduate into the animal kingdom. There are even fewer animals than there are plants. And the animals depend on the plants to live. And there are many levels of animals, many kingdoms, many hierarchies within that animal kingdom. So you see a vast triangle growing here. The foundation is all the minerals. The next level up, even smaller, is the plants. And the next level up, even smaller, are the animals. But these are all interdependent. They need each other. They sustain each other. They cannot live without the other. The minerals are transformed by the plants to create their bodies. The plants are transformed by the animals to create their bodies. And we see a vast, beautiful cycle that is perfectly balanced. Well, at least it used to be. Because then, those animal souls who over millions of years, have evolved through animal bodies and reach the height of the animal kingdom, graduate into the humanoid kingdom. That's us. Now we reached something significant. Because the harmony, the interdependence, the beautiful relationship between the three lower kingdoms is now gone. We in the humanoid kingdom do not respect our younger brothers and sisters. We destroy them. We trample them. We torture them. We abuse them. We rape them. We are exterminating them. We are polluting them. We are ending life. Everywhere on the planet, in every conceivable area of our existence on this planet, we are destroying life. Nowhere are we improving it. Not on any level. I wish that was untrue, truly. I wish I could say, I found one place where we're doing something good to help nature, but I don't see it. And I hope somebody will find one and come tell me because I don't see it. We're polluting every level of the lower kingdoms. We are modifying genetically all the animals, or exterminating them. Many are gone already. Many more are on the edge of disappearing. And those that remain have become monsters. The plant kingdom is the same story. Nowadays, a farmer cannot grow whatever he wants. He has to get permission from a corporation or a government. Nowadays, none of us can sustain ourselves farming because the corporations and the government, because our culture, our civilization, has created a situation within which we cannot. It's impossible. We would die. We would starve. We're raping and destroying the mineral kingdom. All of that erosion, the changes of the land, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the tsunamis, the earthquakes, all of that is a result 
of what we are doing to the earth. Scientists haven't admitted it yet. They haven't seen it yet. But they will. It's all interdependent. No element is isolated from another. The humanoid needs the three lower kingdoms. Moreover, the humanoid should be guiding them. When we study in the ancient scriptures, we always hear that Adam was created by Jehovah. And given the command to name and organize the animals, the plants, to protect them, to guide them, to help them. Because Adam represents, in that context, the most advanced level of mechanical nature, the human organism. There is no more sophisticated physical body on the planet. There's also no more misunderstood body. The physical organism that each one of you is sitting in right now is the most fantastic technological advancement in the history of this planet. It isn't the iPad. It's your body. The physical body is an incredible machine. It is not you. That which is you is your soul, your essence, which has been evolving up through these kingdoms for millennia. That's right. Every one of us was an animal. Every one of us was a plant. Every one of us was a mineral. And you ask, how come I can't remember? Well, you can't even remember your dreams last night. You can't even remember what you were doing last week or where you were last month. You can't remember your childhood. How can you remember what happened before that? You can if you awaken your consciousness. If you work with the techniques to restore those memories, because they are there in your soul. This is why the Buddha Shakyamuni related the Jataka tales. Hundreds of stories about his previous existences as animals, as plants. And he was not the only one to relate those stories. It didn't only happen to him. It happens to every soul. That's how nature functions. This is a well-known fact in many traditions called transmigration. What were the other names? Nonetheless, those essences evolve up to the humanoid kingdom and receive a body like ours. But the soul, the mind, is still an animal. We receive the humanoid body in order to develop ourselves into human beings. But unfortunately, we have maintained the animal mind. So all those instinctive behaviors and desires and automatic mechanical reactions we just have made them stronger. We have an intellect, true. But the vast majority of the rest of what constitutes our identity is animal. Anger, lust, desire, envy, jealousy, pride, greed, gluttony. To kill or be killed. That defines us. We would like to say it's something else, but look at our civilization. What is running it? It is to compete, to conquer, to kill the other guy before he kills me. We take that approach in every way of life, in business, in religion. Those are not human values, those are animal values. Nonetheless, the humanoid body is the most advanced machine on the planet. It has capacities about which we have scarcely dreamed. And that's because, as we look at these kingdoms, we see that in each level, each of those bodies of minerals is a womb within which a soul is emerged to become a plant. And the plant bodies are a womb within which souls emerge to become animals. And those animal bodies are likewise a womb of a cosmic mother, within which souls perfect themselves in order to advance into humanoid bodies. Therefore, this is why Samael Amvior stated, 
Humanity is a womb. But what will come from that womb? Humanity, all these physical bodies, are shells within which something is growing. But what is growing in us? Are we behaving like angels? Are we managing this planet the way angels would manage it? The way masters or gods would manage it? Are we managing this planet the way the cosmic mother would have us manage it? Do the angels, do the gods live their moment-to-moment -moment existence in order to satisfy their desires? In order to feed their lust and their greed and their envy? In order to make others afraid? In order to dominate? In order to conquer? In order to steal? Or to be intoxicated or drunk? Do the angels behave in those ways? Animals do. Not real human beings. A real human being is a master. A real human being is one who has mastered the human organism, has conquered it for the benefit of everyone, not just himself. Our master is an angel, a Buddha. A Buddha is one who is awake, has the consciousness awake, knows their innermost, knows their divine mother, knows the laws of nature, and knows how to command them. This is what a master is. A master doesn't seek to feed their pride, to become a big shot, to be famous, to be recognized, to get money, to get power. This is not what a master wants. A master wants to guide others and help them to come where he is, to have serenity and peace, to be at harmony with the laws of nature, to advance the whole to bring his family to the light. You see, all these kingdoms are our brothers and sisters. They are our family. They are our mothers and fathers, our children. But we treat the plants like they're not even alive. We treat the animals as if they don't feel anything, as if they are just a carcass that walks. We don't understand that an animal and a plant and a mineral have emotion, consciousness. They perceive, they feel, they think in their level. They are alive. And the difference between us is not as great as we arrogantly believe. So you see, the purpose of all of this this hugely complex and sophisticated life that is flowing on this planet in this moment, all of it is flowing upwards into the humanoid kingdom, into us. What do we do with those energies and forces? What are we using them for? To dominate our neighbors? To kill each other? Everyone loves to praise this civilization, but what is it built on? Everyone loves to praise the United States and claim the United States is the greatest country in the history of the world. But no one realizes that the United States was built upon the death of millions of natives and on the backs of slavery. No one wants to recognize that the modern countries throughout the world are built upon exploitation and corruption. And anyone who's worked a retail job or a minimum wage job, knows the truth of it. That is not life. To work and have nothing is not life. It is slavery. This whole planet and all the forms of life on it are this great pyramid of living things. But we are not the pinnacle. The humanoid organism is only a step. I'm sorry to shatter your illusions about humans being the greatest thing in the world. They are not. The humanoid organism 
is a vessel. That's all it is. It's a vessel. You won't have it long. You might have it for a few more days. You might have it for a few more months or years. No one knows. But it is a vessel that channels and transforms forces. In the same way that every other body receives, transforms, and transmits energy. The minerals do that. The plants do that. The animals do that. The human organism is no different. But we scarcely tap its true potential to transform energy. And that's because our mind is a complete mess. Psychologically, we are a disaster. This is why, not long ago, <clears throat> a great meeting was held in the internal worlds amongst those divinities that are responsible for guiding humanity. And all the evidence was placed on the table. And the judgment was reached that this humanity has failed. And so the times of the end are upon us. This is a simple truth that was predicted in every religion in the world. And we are in the beginning of that ending. Because this humanity has failed. Just as in the mineral kingdom, a small number of those seed embryos of consciousness have enough strength and wisdom to graduate and become plants. Throughout the vast plant kingdom, only a small number have the strength and wisdom to graduate into the animal kingdom. And even fewer in the animal kingdom have the strength and wisdom and development to emerge out of being animals and to become humanoids or intellectual animals. But now, in this womb, very few have the strength and the wisdom to stop being animals and to become angels, true masters. Very few. Most of the seeds in humanity are already lost, too corrupted, too degenerated. So nature, the Divine Mother, in her great love for all living things, will reabsorb them by means of one of her faces, which is Kalima, Durga, Persephone, Hecate, the Divine Mother Death, who's in charge of the infernal worlds, what we call hell. And she will take all of those fallen, failed seeds and recycle them, purging them of all their impurities and so that one day they can try again, many thousands of years now, from now, when they've become pure again. That is what hell is. This whole planet is already sinking into it. You see, when those forces descend down the tree of life, things become more complicated. At the very heights, at the absolute, at the Ein Sof, at Keter, life is very simple. It is one, united. It is God. And level by level down the Sephiroth, life becomes more complex. Three laws, six laws, twelve laws, all the way down until we get to the physical world, which should have... 48 laws modifying existence in the physical world. And you can still feel that simplicity of life if you get out of the cities. If you go out to the country, things feel nicer, simpler, not as complicated. But when you come to the city, it's very complex, very confusing, very heavy, very dense. And that's because the laws are sinking lower, below Malkut, into the abyss. Where every level of hell, it gets worse, more and more dense, more and more complicated, because all of those pressures are there to purify the souls, to purge them. So everything that we think is so good and wonderful and admirable is sinking. 
nothing will remain. Nothing. What will happen is that out of this huge womb of humanity, a few seeds will, grant, will be given the granted right to be initiated into a new level of life. Not every seed. It isn't a, a right that every soul gets automatically. Because to go to this next level, one escapes mechanical nature. One moves into conscious nature. To truly become Adam. A man made into the image of God. Who can command the plants and the animals and the minerals. Who can create life. Who can organize life. Who can help others. That is a master. That is Adam. That is a real human being. That is a process by which one reaches perfection stage by stage. It is not easy. Right now, all we really know about, and we don't know much about it, is the physical body. Even the scientists know we only use a small fraction of what the body actually has inside of it. Scientists differ in their estimates. The brain itself, we only use 3 or 5% of it. Some say 10%, but I think it's less, given the behaviors that we can observe. What about all our glands? There are many things in our bodies that we ignore. Many powers. Many abilities. And we've heard stories that some people have learned how to use them. Because you can learn how to use them. So our physical body in Kabbalah is called Malkut. This means the kingdom. We have a physical body according to the kingdom that we belong to. All of us have humanoid bodies. We're in the humanoid kingdom. Our own Malkut is humanoid. Not human yet. And this body <clears throat> has its physiology. It has a spinal column. It has three nervous systems. It has a very sophisticated and beautiful arrangement of organs and systems that receive energy, transform energy, and transmit it. But we have no control over it. Everything in us is happening automatically, mechanically, without any awareness or intervention on our part. We just want to eat and drink and sleep and have sex. And we don't know why. But that physical body is only one aspect of what makes a living entity. The physical body exists because it has a vital aspect, what we call the vital body, the body of energy. It can be called the ethereal body or the body of chi or prana. This is the body that the acupuncturists work on or people who work with qigong, they work with this body. It is a body of energy that empowers the physical body. These two cannot be separated in terms of existence. The physical body and the vital body are really one with two parts. Now what's interesting here is, I told you before that life was descending through dimensions. The vital body is in the fourth dimension. It is not here in the third dimension, directly. It's multidimensional in the sense that this energy is what's empowering our physical body. If you've ever felt your arm or leg fall asleep, you're sensing a separation between the two aspects, vital and astral, or vital and physical. When an amputee has an arm or leg removed, they still feel their arm or leg. They're feeling the vital body which is still there. <clears throat> the vital body is in the fourth dimension, what we call Eden. This is where all of our energy and forces are. Superior to that, in the fifth dimension, we have an astral body and a mental body, related with Hod and Netzach on the tree of life. 
The emotional body, the astral body, is related with our emotions and feelings. It's related with the heart. The mental body is the body of thought related with the brain and the mind. And above this, there is what's called a causal body, or the body of willpower, the body of consciousness. Conscious will. Unfortunately, none of us have these yet in their full form. We have the shadows of them, the embryos of them. Throughout the process of our evolution through the three lower kingdoms, nature was elaborating these internal bodies for us. Our soul, our essence, the spark of consciousness, is an extraction from the sephirah of Tifereth. It is conscious will, but simple. And that spark, when it first emerges into nature, is given lunar mental body, astral body, vital body, and physical bodies. These are gifts from nature. Divine Mother says, here are the vessels you need, the vehicles you need. This is your mind, your heart, your body. We call them protoplasmic because they are a modification of forces in nature that are given to us, but they do not belong to us. Over the course of millions of years, that essence inhabits its protoplasmic bodies and takes physical bodies and gradually evolves as a mineral, as a plant, as an animal, until eventually it gains the right to enter the humanoid kingdom. That humanoid, you and me, enters into a humanoid physical body with these ancient protoplasmic bodies, the gifts of nature, that carry all of our memories, all of our history, all of our knowledge in them. Well, at least that's how it would be if we were an innocent humanity, the way we were in the Garden of Eden when we first emerged into humanoid bodies. But we are not an innocent humanity anymore. We discovered desire. We became entranced with power, with lust. And over the course of thousands of years, we created the ego and infected these protoplasmic bodies with all of our karma. You see, these protoplasmic bodies are vessels for our soul, but these bodies are our mind. What we think, the thoughts we feel, are flowing from our protoplasmic lunar mental body. The emotions, the sensations in our heart that we feel are flowing through our protoplasmic lunar astral body. The energies in our body, the instincts, the drives that we feel are flowing from our lunar vital body into our lunar physical body. All of that driven by all those behaviors, habits, and desires that we developed through the three lower kingdoms. So we're animals inside of a fancy car and driving it around like mad. The master seeks or the master is one who's conquered all of that. Conquered it. And learned how to transform into something different. The key is inside the body. Every body has a spinal column. The physical body has a spinal column. The vital body has it, the astral body has it, the mental body has it, the causal body. You see, all these bodies are reflections of one another throughout different dimensions. Nature works in patterns. The spine is where everything in us is organized. This is our tree of life. 
This is our tree of knowledge. It is the spine. Our nervous systems, our brain, our ability to perceive, to see, to touch, to walk, to run, to eat, to do everything flows in and out of the spine. You cannot be alive without a spine. You cannot function. It is the central pillar of our temple. But we don't really understand what it is, what it can do, what's hidden inside of it. The Divine Mother creates these bodies for us, gives us these vessels, and then we receive instructions on how to use them. And those instructions are encoded in our religions. Those instructions are in our consciousness if we know how to retrieve them. You don't have to get them out of a book. You can get them directly from your Divine Mother. What we see when we examine those kingdoms is that the mineral and the plant kingdoms use all the energy in themselves in a very balanced way, in a very efficient way, in order to advance their development. And the animal kingdom also, in, an, in its way, following its course of development, uses its energies according to the laws that apply to the animal kingdom. But there's a great shift that happens in that transition between these kingdoms. In the mineral kingdom, there's always an exchange of forces, positive and negative. Minerals combine and recombine to create new compounds, new elements. And we see that in all the different ways that we measure forces in the minerals, electricity, magnetism, acidity, and those types of forces that always have a positive and negative, a polarity. We see the same in the plant kingdom. In the plant kingdom, we see the emergence of sexuality in many levels, from asexual up to sexual levels. In the plant kingdom, we see that also, but it's sexual of a certain degree. So we see throughout these kingdoms, sexuality that begins with very simple plus and minus and advances through more and more sophisticated forms of combinations until we reach the humanoid kingdom. In the humanoid kingdom, we have forgotten a cosmic law. The animal kingdom is given the law of instinct. And they follow the instructions of their own innermost by following that instinct. And they only use their sexual forces according to instinct, which in most cases is in spring. And they only use it to procreate and create a child. That's it. They don't use it every day for fun. But then when those souls graduate into the human kingdom, they're given new laws. To become a humanoid, those forces have to be managed and transformed. These are laws related with chastity. And the science of those laws is called Tantra or alchemy. And it's the method by which a humanoid organism takes all the energies and forces in the sexual organs, transforms them, and raises them up the central column of the spine in order to nourish the brain and the endocrine system, in order to fully develop the brain. This is the most ancient, beautiful secret that was once called the Ark in the Judeo-Christian traditions. The Ark is actually the Aron Kadosh, the sacred chest. That Ark is Tantra, or alchemy. It is the science of taking those forces and combining a man and a woman to combine those forces to restrain them, to transform them, and to send them up the spine. What is that energy? Why is that needed? That energy is the Divine Mother. In every level of life, in every kingdom, she creates through sex. The great power of the Divine Mother is her womb. 
That is what makes her who she is. From the cosmic level to the atomic level. The power of the mother is her ability to make a child. To create life. But the cosmic mother cannot do that in us as long as we remain an animal. If we remain as an animal, she can only create animals through us. And that's why a soul who works seriously in spiritual development in the, in the past was given the clue. Once you've awakened consciousness, once you've mastered a certain degree of any spiritual tradition, you were given the clue, the secret knowledge, the highest tantra, sexual transmutation. Scientific chastity. It is the first commandment to not fornicate. But to take those forces, use them, but under divine will, not animal will. To take those energies inside and give them to the Divine Mother. With that, she can create. Jesus said, that which is physical is physical, and that which is spiritual is spiritual. If you want to be born again, we have to take the spirit, right? And the water. That spirit is the daimon. That's what spirit is in Greek. That spirit is the divine mother. The water is sexual. The mayim in Hebrew. <clears throat> the waters of Genesis, creation. Those waters are sexual. The Divine Mother creates through the minerals, through their sexual forces. She creates through the plants, through their sexual forces. She creates the animals through their sexual energy. And she creates more intellectual animals like us through our animal sexuality. But how is she going to create an angel? How is she going to create a master, a Buddha? Through lust? Obviously not. How will a god come from that? And if our tradition of lust and fornication is so great, then why are we in such a mess? We've had millions of years of it. We haven't created any angels. And the few that have emerged, emerged because they had the secret knowledge. They conquered themselves. <clears throat> the energy... The sexual energy is the Divine Mother herself. It is her power. And we call it Kundalini. We call it the Divine Mother Kundalini. Devi Kundalini. The Goddess Kundalini. Some people talk about it just like it's any old energy in nature. It is not. It is not a mechanical energy. You can't turn it off and on like a switch. You can't trick it. There are a lot of people out there who think that if you go to a certain ashram and you pay a certain amount of money, you can awaken your kundalini in two weeks. This is snake oil. Salesman. You can't trick the Divine Mother. She's known you for millions of years. She knows your ways. She will give you what you deserve. Nothing more, nothing less. For her to be born in your spine is for her to give you her power. Can you imagine that? Now let me ask yourself, do you deserve it? What would you do with power? If you were given divine power with your mind as it is now, what would your mind do with it? Feed its lust? Feed its pride. Make itself out into a big shot. Try to be famous. Try to get power in the world. Try to get money. Yeah, that's exactly what we would do with it. Why would the Divine Mother give us that power when we've proven that we're not interested in helping the planet, helping her, helping our brothers and sisters in the other kingdoms? We want to kill them all. We want to conquer them. We want to eat them. We don't care about anything but our desire. 
So why would she give us that? And yet there are thousands of books and groups and schools who teach you that. that You can awaken your kundalini and get all this power being just the way you are. Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you a secret. You can get power. And it is related to kundalini, but it is inverted. Remember, all the forces of nature are polarized. Polarized energies. So just the same way that she can rise up the spine, she can flow down it. That downward flowing energy is the tail of a demon. That's why they're shown with tails. It is their animal power active and alive. You can have that easily. Very easy. Simple as reading a couple of books, learning a couple of techniques, and you can instantly start working with those powers. Because all of us are that close to the edge of becoming fully-fledged, awakened demons. Because of our ego. Because of desire. Because of pride and lust. But to go upwards is not easy. Very difficult. Every single step along the spinal column is tests, ordeals. We have to prove ourselves. We have to conquer ourselves. Nothing is given for free. Every single vertebrae represents tests, psychological tests, tests of desire, tests of pride, tests of lust and fear and envy and gluttony and greed and all the elements we have within. When we pass a test, we can receive that force. And step by step, we raise the 33 degrees. You've heard about the 33 years of the life of Jesus, the 33 degrees of the Freemasons. Those are symbols of the steps that we have to walk up the spine, taking that energy back to God, purifying ourselves of all of our animal elements. To enter that process, you have to be with a spouse. A single person cannot do this. Because a single person cannot have a child. A single person cannot engender a child or give birth to a child. It takes a couple. As above, so below. The angel is born of chastity. Tantra. And this is why in the ancient traditions, the most secret, holy symbol of every religion was a couple united in sexual union. Even in Christianity and Judaism, which they deny now, that the evidence is there in the scriptures. You can learn about it in the Gnostic websites. The most ancient symbol that was hidden in the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Solomon was two angels united in a sexual embrace. The Jews know this, but they keep quiet. And it was when the Romans saw it that they destroyed the temple. Because they thought it was depraved. They saw it the way their minds were. Like it was degenerated like their minds. They didn't see that it was something holy and pure. That symbol encodes the secret. That a male and a female working in sexual cooperation in scientific chastity unite forces, restrain them, transform them, and the Divine Mother takes them and creates life inside. That which is physical is physical. That which is spiritual is spiritual. If we take our sexual energy and make it spiritual, it gives birth spiritually. It creates the soul. What happens then By passing the ordeals, by satisfying the test that the Divine Mother provides to us, little by little we raise the force of the Kundalini in the spinal column. We awaken the chakras along the spinal column. We awaken all the hidden powers of a real human being. In other words, we begin to return to Eden to restore our place where we fell from. There is a spine in each body. There's a spine in the physical body. When that energy reaches the top, we receive an initiation. 
we graduate into a new level. It's the initiation, the first initiation of major mysteries. The kundalini or the serpent of the physical body. In that moment, a connection is made in our soul, in our spirit. And our innermost, our being inside, becomes a master. You see, our innermost, our being, who's been working with our Divine Mother throughout all those millennia to raise that conscious spark through all those kingdoms, finally reaches the humanoid kingdom, and that human soul, that person in the humanoid body, finally takes advantage of that energy and achieves something. That innermost becomes a master, not the human person, not the physical body, not the soul. The innermost becomes a master, our master. Inside, the innermost becomes a master. This is our Atman, our Chesed, our inner Buddha. But that's only the beginning. Then the same process has to happen in the vital body. Those energies have to be raised up the spinal column of the vital body. And 33 degrees of tests and ordeals have to be passed. And again, with the astral body. And again with the mental body. And again with the causal body. Five serpents. Have you ever seen a Buddha with five serpents over his head? That's the meaning. There are five serpents related with these bodies. There are more serpents than that. But for our discussion today, we're talking about just five. The reason is, the person who's managed to raise those energies of the Divine Mother in themselves and reach the fifth initiation of major mysteries becomes a master proper. An actual master. Not a complete master, but a master that's beginning. Because that person has raised the forces of the Divine Mother to illuminate their physical body, to illuminate their energy, to illuminate their heart, to illuminate their mind, and to enforce and sustain their conscious will. This person has the Divine Mother inside. This person is a child of the Divine Mother, finally. This person in the internal worlds is a Buddha, an angel, really. But is not done because the ego is still alive. You see, this whole process is hard. There are a lot of challenges, a lot of ordeals. But this is not about eliminating the ego. That comes next. This is only about returning to Eden and creating the soul. In other words, in each of these serpents, we transcend the protoplasmic bodies. Especially in the top three, Hod, Netzar, and Tiferet. When the serpent of Kundalini is raised in the astral body, what's really happening is our Divine Mother is creating a new body for us, unless we had one already. She creates a solar astral body. This is a new astral body. This, esoterically in initiation, is the first appearance of Christ. When Christ first appears in us is when we create the Christ astral, the solar astral body. This is a body of gold. It is a body that is created from scientific chastity. It's created from the purification of the sexual forces, united with prayer and longing and the wisdom and intelligence of the Divine Mother. This is represented in all the religions. When Athena has the weapons crafted by Vulcan in the forge to give to Theseus or Perseus, those weapons represent the solar bodies, the armor, the shield, the helm, these are those solar bodies. This is the chariot of Ezekiel 
the Merkaba of the Kabbalists. This is the Tosoma Heliakon of the Greeks, the Sahu of the Egyptians. This is the boat of Ra that travels across the lakes of peace. This is the soul. This is an ancient secret mystery. Each of these bodies is just a vessel. It's a vehicle like your physical one, but better. Because it's not made from fornication. It's not made from sin. It's made from divine atoms. They are bodies of incredible beauty and splendor. But they're given to us for a reason. Not for fun and games. Not so we can take our astral body and go out in the astral plane and investigate the lives of other people. It isn't so we can take our astral body and go and spy on our neighbor. Or go see if what we suspect about our wife is true. These bodies are needed because in order for us to completely eliminate the ego, we need these weapons. We need the protection. We need the armaments. If we try to go into our own infernal worlds with our protoplasmic bodies, which are infected by ego, we have nothing to defend ourselves with. No defense, no protection. Because those protoplasmic bodies are diseased. The solar bodies are perfect. Well, on their way to perfection. The solar bodies are perfected in the serpents of light, which come later. So a master is one who has reached the initiation of Tiferet, the initiation of major mysteries related with Tiferet, and has received a sword. The sword is symbolic. We've all heard about the flaming sword that guards the way to Eden, the flaming sword of any great god or angel is the kundalini. What does a sword represent? <clears throat> Willpower. But right now, our will, as a humanity, is in conquering each other, stabbing each other in the back, stealing and lying, feeding our lust. Our will is all about that. But the Divine Mother gives a sword inflamed to a master who will serve her. Who will become an exponent of the divine will. That is that sword. That is something that is earned. Is not given for free. This is what the divine mother wants. This is why we exist It is to create the soul and to return to God and to advance our evolution. What happens then, when you're working in this process through these initiations of major mysteries, you're transcending the mechanical laws of nature. See, all of us right now are complete victims of the mechanical laws of nature. We have little or no control over what happens in our lives, in our communities, in our culture. We can't control ourselves and we can't control nature. We think we can, but a little storm comes along and shows us differently. Or somebody falls asleep at the controls of a machine and kills a lot of people. Or destroys an area of nature from negligence and foolishness. We can't even control our own nature inside. But a master commands nature. We've all heard about Moses parting the waters, creating miracles, Jesus raising the dead back to life. All the prophets have performed miracles. All the saints, all the Buddhas could fly through the air, walk on the water, command the flames, call the tempests, split the earth. And that's because that power of the Kundalini and the spinal column of each body makes them a priest, a magi, a magician. Magi or mag means priest. This triangle 
of Tiferet, Netzach, and Hod in Kabbalah is called the magical triangle or the triangle of the priesthood because it is here that the real priest works on behalf of others. It is through the powers of conscious will in Tiferet in the sixth dimension. It is through the powers of conscious thought through the mental body in Netzach in the fifth dimension. It is through the powers of the astral body, conscious emotion, divine emotion, that the magician or priest works on behalf of others. This magical triangle also embraces Yasad and Malkut. Magic is where magic is performed in these spheres. These spheres are where, through conscious will, the innermost works through his human soul, which is us, to benefit others, to guide the souls. You see, all of nature is organized, every kingdom. The minerals are in groups, the plants are in groups, families. The animals are in families, and every family is guided. Every family has a guide. That guide in Sanskrit is called a diva, an angel, an intelligence that's responsible for that family to guide them. Even humanoid families have guides, but we ignore them. But if you studied the, the Iliad, you remember that the, the family of Priam take their totems, the statues of their family gods, in order to protect them when they have to abandon Troy. Right? Those symbols, those, sim those statues represent the guardian angel of that family. We all have that. Our families have it, and we as individuals have it. But we don't listen. We persist and insist on following our foolishness. And our, guide, our guides, our guardians, attempt to help, but... There's a limit. Cause and effect is still the law. If you shoot yourself, you will die. A master takes his place in the ranks of those hierarchies that manage nature. A master guides beings on other levels, below him. Your own innermost your own being may have relations with certain kingdoms. And if you achieve the degree of mastery, your being will place you in a certain position in order to help other souls. In different kingdoms. Maybe mineral, maybe plant, maybe animal, maybe humanoid, maybe angelic. There are masters who guide and teach the angels. That is our true evolutionary path. It isn't to get rich. It isn't try to, to just try to fill our house up with a lot of junk and then die. That isn't why we're here. We're here to emerge out of the shell of our body as angels. And to step into this evolutionary path into the conscious circle of humanity. To leave the unconscious circle, to become a conscious one, and then to help the unconscious ones. That's our purpose. And all along that process, for millions of years, our Divine Mother is the one helping us, trying to give us the ability to do it. But we always slap her away. We spit on her. We ignore her. We curse her. We do it physically. We do it psychologically. Don't forget your mother. I'm not talking about your terrestrial mother. I'm talking about your internal mother. Go back to her. She will guide you. She's the one who takes her child from a simple mineral up to being a god. If you want to transcend suffering, if you want to help others, she is the one who will take you by the hand along the entire path 
and she will never abandon you. Even now that you have abandoned her, she is waiting. She's waiting for you psychologically and spiritually, but also coiled up in the bottom of your spine, in the Muladhara Chakra. All of her potentiality is coiled there, waiting for you to awaken her. Do you have any questions? Yeah, there are a number of practices you can use to strengthen and limber up your spine. The spinal column is very important. And it's necessary that anyone who takes this type of path seriously do a lot to protect their spine and make it strong and flexible. The main most important, single most important that cannot be emphasized enough rule is to relax. Just relax. Most of us are so tense all the time, we don't even realize it. And when we're tense, why? It's because our minds are tense. Our mind is running a thousand miles an hour, our heart is racing with all kinds of uncomfortable feelings, and we get tense because we don't like it. We want something or we don't want something, so we're tense. It's desire. And that tension in the body makes you sick, and it builds up negative energy and stores it in your muscles and can hurt you physically. And it gets worse as you get older. Some people, even young, but some older people become so tense, they're like they're not even flesh anymore. They're rocks, steel muscles. It's not good. That's years and years and years of tension that's stored in those muscles. Untransformed impressions energy that's trapped. Samael Anvior was like a sponge, like a baby, totally relaxed. And he was dealing with a lot of intense energies, a lot. People were trying to kill him. He was perfectly relaxed. He wasn't tense. We need to learn that, to be relaxed. It's the main thing. And he said, in fact, Whenever you remember yourself, relax. Whenever you observe yourself, relax. Relax all your muscles. Constantly relax yourself. Every moment of every day, keep relaxing. It makes a huge difference. And likewise, if you cannot relax now, then when you try to meditate, that's all you're going to be trying to do is relax. And when you begin meditation, you should already be perfectly relaxed. So that would be the main thing I would recommend. Relax, relax, relax. Constant relaxation. And do what you can to help that. Take walks. Take hot baths. Go out in nature. Feel the air. Swim in the natural waters. Take a break from so much thinking. Clear your head. Go outside and admire your mother. She's beautiful. She's much more beautiful than concrete and glass and steel and bricks. She's much more beautiful than your computer screen. Far more beautiful. Go out and take that energy from her. She can sustain and nourish you. She will feed your soul. Second to that, there are many exercises you can learn to improve your spinal health. And the two main groups are the Tibetan exercises of rejuvenation. And there's a book about that and also runic practices, which can also help. And there are a number of other stretches, but more, mostly it's just relax. There's a question in the back. Yeah. Negatively. So should you 
try to reduce that as much as possible by recycling and, you know, because people are going to use plastic, it seems like, so should you really be conscious about, like, your, your carbon footprint, I guess, in a way, in terms of plastic and stuff like that? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think we have to reduce how much plastic we use right. and be very conscious of what we purchase and utilize. Most people buy bottles of drinks and throw them away and don't realize that that plastic, that plastic is sitting out in the ocean right now. It's in landfills. It's not going to break down for a long time. Like this pen, like I felt bad writing down. Pens, even our clothes have plastic a lot of the time. Polyester and other synthetic fabrics and all these synthetic things that we keep making and buying that we really don't need. We need to be more conscious of what we do. But ultimately, that is really secondary. The reason is this planet is about to be purged. The Divine Mother is going to cleanse herself. She's about to take a shower in fire. So in the end, you know, reducing your carbon footprint and those kind of things are good. I'm not saying to not do them. Yeah, do what you can do. You know, another thing is to eat properly. Most of us are eating stuff we don't even know what we're eating. The minerals, the plants, and the animals that we consume are modified. Genetically modified, chemically modified, even with radioactive elements. And so those elements are filling our bodies and making our bodies sick and our minds sick. And let me explain, I'll get back, let me explain one more thing. In order to succeed in this process of awakening Kundalini and creating the soul, your body has to be prepared for that. It isn't an easy thing. It's not like the Kundalini is going to come along and it's going to be like walking in the park. It is not easy. It's transformative. That energy of the Divine Mother is the very creative power of the universe. It's a lot of energy. And you have to learn to manage it and deal with it. And with our bodies as they are now, we're sick. We don't know what's in our water. We don't know what's in our air. We don't know what's going on with these tomatoes that now have the hormones of pigs in them. Right? Or we buy meat at the supermarket that's filled with artificial hormones and chemicals and pesticides and all kinds of stuff that's not natural. I'm not saying everybody should go out and immediately become vegans, you know, and stop eating. We have to eat and survive. But do what you can to try to take pure food from nature. If you can go pick your own fruit, if you can grow your own fruit, do it. If you can get fresh, real vegetables grown from seeds, do it. If you can get healthy meats like halal or kosher or things that are properly, where the animals are properly cared for, do that. Better than the, the, the halal and kosher is at least an incremental step better than the food that comes out of these giant factories around the world where the animals are processed like machines and treated like machines. It's horrible. And we need to become conscious of those things and try to manage our health better. All those energies that we take in we have to transform them. If you're a very aggressive person, you're dealing with a lot of anger, you might want to watch your meat intake. You might want to look at what you're eating. If you're a very anxious, depressed, sensitive person, you might need to watch what you're eating. You might be eating garbage that's helping you lean towards these bad behaviors. By managing your diet and your food and your exercise and health, you can go a long way to make your mind more stable and to give yourself a better environment to reach some spiritual development. There's another question in the very back, I think. Yeah, Sue wants to know, does being overweight affect you negatively in the work with the Divine Mother? Does being overweight affect you negatively? Absolutely it does. If someone in this work is overweight, they will have a serious obstacle. So it's highly advised that you work on that. Try to uncover what it is in you that makes you eat too much or be lazy. We all have different body types. The idea of overweight is also overblown in this society. Some people are naturally bigger and some people are naturally smaller. When I'm talking about overweight, I mean where you're unhealthy. You can be big or small, doesn't matter, as long as you're healthy and strong. But someone who's significantly overweight will have bad back problems. Their spine will hurt. They won't be able to relax. They'll have a hard time meditating. They'll have a hard time concentrating. When you're very overweight, 
it produces a lethargy in your psyche. And gluttony becomes a, very, a big problem in laziness. So those are significant issues you have to look at. Another question back here? Yes, sir. Sure. The 48 laws that are managing Malkut are an aggregation of the laws of the Sephiroth above. So when you study how the laws of nature function through the tree of life, it makes perfect sense. It's not like you can say law number one is the law that you can't park here. Or not, you know, it's not like that. Those are the mathematical equation that is the combination of all the spheres above in Malkut. So there are nine spheres above Malkuth, right? But it's one law, three laws, uh, 12 laws, 24 laws, like that. And all those added up equal Malkuth. There's a few lectures that explain. It's quite simple. But you would include gravity as one of those laws. Gravity is relative to the physical world, yes. But each, you can't, I don't think in my experience that you can limit a law to saying it's gravity. Yeah. Because similar forces are at work in other planes where you don't have 48 laws, laws that are like gravity, that function like gravity, because gravity is a force of attraction, of magnetism. We experience it in a certain way here, but if you go to other dimensions, there are similar laws. So basically, the laws that we study, there's, they are just uh, the Sephiroth inside other Sephiroth, basically. Yes? The, the synthetic elements? Yeah, I guess. Like, they can create an element, but, like, it, it, it has to be at, like, minus 500 degrees or something crazy. It only exists for a few seconds. Yeah. So they say the scientists are, are playing a lot, of, bad, huh? a lot of experiments. Not necessarily. But it's not necessarily bad. Go into that, and then, and then the body of that consciousness is then destroyed? Not necessarily. Exactly. A scientist cannot create life. A scientist can only modify existing forms. The only one that can create life is God. To take elements, put them together, and put a soul in there. Only God can do that. And uh, so when they genetically modify, like, corn and whatnot, <coughs> those probably are not inhabited by a soul anymore, huh? Since they're modified? They can be. They, they can be deformed. Nature is very complicated. Everything has life in some form or level, but it's modified. If it has energy, it has life. And if it's modified to function in a harmful way, then it's a negative form that creates a lot of karma. Case in point, atomic energy. One more thing, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. what Please. If destroys an atom, you can destroy atoms. Isn't that destroying the bodies of, of what these, what these um, consciousnesses It is. Yeah, that, isn't that very bad it's a terrible thing to, to the so splitting of the atom is a is a terrible crime. That's right. The of of souls. Not only that, but when an atom is split, a lot of negative atoms are released. Negative, negative atoms from the infernal worlds. Okay. So not only is there physical radioactivity, but there are negative spiritual atoms that are split and release. Why they're so harmful for us and they're the, the effects of the nuclear and atomic energy uh, experiments is really unimaginable. Samael and Vior wrote about it a few times and it's bad, very bad. Is there a question? Yeah, you said that we had a lot of dead elements that we surround ourselves with and there's a lot of material. Um, with the elements that we've made, it still matters. Does it still have it depends. Every, every living form has an energy in it, life, right? But there's also dead forms. So a lot of the forms that we work with are dead. They're corpses that we work with. So whether that's uh, atomic matter or material matter, different elements that we combine to make things. And the way we have to look at it is that... Uh, Atomic structures and molecular structures are hugely complex and apply to the tree of life. 
So I, I mentioned just now, when we split an atom, we split a physical atom, right? And we release the energy that was in that atom. It's an enormous amount of energy in one atom. But when that split occurs, a doorway is opened. And that doorway affects not only the superior worlds, but the inferior worlds. The splitting of an atom is not just physical. Because an atom is not just physical. It's matter, energy, and consciousness. So there's energy from above and below that is affected and released. It creates an enormous impact. So similarly, when we're manipulating matter in the world, we're also manipulating matter internally. Right? Like when we have a discussion with each other, we're manipulating mental matter. Right now, we're manipulating mental emotional and hopefully conscious forms if, if everyone's conscious of the conversation. If someone's angry or irritated or feeling uh, some very negative emotion, then they're affecting very negative forms of matter. Not physical, but internal. So similarly, everything around us is like that. This table has other aspects of its existence, not just physical. And all the atoms in it are like that. It's mind-boggling. But when someone awakens consciousness, they start to intuitively perceive those things. Samael Anvior was experiencing those types of things, and he was explaining that when you awaken consciousness in the causal world, you can see the karma of, of something. You can see the number of atoms in it. You can see the mathematics of it. And not in the intellect, but with the consciousness. It's not hard. It's just something you see there. You see the other aspects. When you see in the fourth dimension then you see its eternal aspect. You see its progression over time. So that would be, um, what about when we use elements in the positive sense as far as, uh, let's say, things we put on our altar? That's not something that we use negatively. Or do we use it as devotion? How is that other end supposed to be? Well, you've identified exactly the key. This physical body is a transformer of energy. And every moment we're receiving energies from our atmosphere, from breathing, from food that we're digesting, from our senses, from our soul, right? A lot of energy in us. And we're transforming it constantly according to our will. What is our will? When we're following a will to feed our lust, all those energies are fortifying and strengthening that lust. If we're taking all those energies and praying sincerely, we're fortifying our soul, our consciousness. If in that prayer we're utilizing an altar, or a prayer book, or a symbol of God, that symbol, let's say it's a statue or a picture, is part of the transformation of that energy, and it is affected by it, without question. And this is how churches, temples, even your bedroom can be magnetized and become a very sacred place. And you can go into certain places and feel sacred energy. And you can go into other places and feel diabolic energy, negative energy. But nowadays, we're so accustomed to the negative energy, we don't notice it. We like it. We don't notice how negative the energy of many places is because we're so used to it now. A lot of questions in the room. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm trying to fathom this model that you have here. You have basically a soul which emanates from deity and it comes down through these, from the being soft and get down to the various kingdoms, down into the physical body. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a change that happens on many levels, not just physical. The, see, the physical body is a. The physical body is the receiver and transformer of energies, right? I don't know if you can see the tree of life that we have back here. Malkuth is the lowest sphere on the tree of life. And all of these forces condense and flow through in, in and out of Malkuth. And we know that because right now we have energy working through us. That's our vital body. We have emotions. That's our astral body. We have thoughts. That's the mental body. We have some degree of will that's related with our conscious will, our essence. We have spirit, but we don't know about spirit. It's too subtle. So likewise, when we begin to work with the forces of Kundalini, it is a more condensed channel for those similar forces to work. Mm -hmm. The physical vehicle dies. Okay? You then reincarnate. 
are you going to derive any benefit from this work in the subsequent vehicle, or do you have to start from scratch? It depends. Good question. The kundalini that's raised in the physical and vital bodies whoops, is, of course, brought into these bodies by means of physical matter. So if you die and you take a new physical body, you will have to raise those forces again. However, if the soul did not fall, that recapitulation of that initiation is very rapid and easy because the initiations are in the soul, not the body. Similarly, that's right. Exactly, and just similar to how your body died, when you get a new body, that new body has to grow and develop, right, according to certain stages. Well, the kundalini is in that. It has to also grow and develop according to certain stages. But that's only with the physical and vital body. The astral body does not die. The solar astral body. Neither does the solar mental body. Neither does the solar causal body. I'm glad you brought this up because it makes an important point. For a, a master working in these low levels who's just acquired the solar bodies, solar, astral, mental, causal, the acquisition of those bottles, bodies provides immortality. We all want that, right? Now, we know our essence, our soul, is immortal in the context of it never dies. But it's constantly transmigrating through nature, according to the karma of the soul. In bodies, out of bodies, in bodies, out of bodies, with no ability to consciously manage that and, and determine it for oneself. A master has immortality in the fifth and sixth dimensions, in these bodies, and thus can self-determine. That is real reincarnation. It is to choose to incarnate. Now, there's still karma, and they still have to work with karma. They're still subject to karma, but they have will, conscious will, to help navigate that. It's no longer a mechanical process. What this means is that the solar bodies start you to become free from the mechanical laws of nature. They begin that. It's not completed. You're not completely over the mechanical laws of nature until you resurrect. With resurrection... I mean, full, real resurrection like Jesus went through. The physical body is sacrificed so that the body of liberation can be made, the body of resurrection. And that is an immortal, perfected physical body. Immortal. That means that right now, Jesus and many other masters at that level inhabit the same physical body for millions of years after that resurrection. And they have powers over that body to go in and out of the third dimension, to change its shape, to change its form. Unimaginable abilities that we can't conceive. Question. That guy that you said was the salt of the sponge, and you said he was under a lot of energy. People were trying to kill him. They, they couldn't kill him if they, if, unless he desired it to, huh? According to the karma, he was able to manage and not be killed by them. But other masters... Well, the karma was so good, it just, it just would not work out for them. Well, it wasn't his karma to be assassinated. He had to die another way. Some masters have the karma to be assassinated. Joan of Arc, for example, was a great master who had, by her karma, to be burned at the stake. And, and that means that she must have did some bad things? She did. She had karma. But with that, she paid it. She is a resurrected master. She resurrected at that instant. That was her resurrection, as far as I understand it. Master. Exactly. We have to emulate that example. That it's a big deal. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked me that because this is a big thing that I was meditating on all week and I forgot to talk about it. <laughs> it shows you how much work I have to do. Samael and Vior in his books told us again and again that we need to return to nature, that we need to return to our Divine Mother. And like many of the things he wrote, it would be easy to take that at face value and read it literally and interpret that as though we should abandon the cities 
and go live out in nature and eat nuts and berries. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what he meant. And you, the proof of that is how he lived his life. Samuel and Vior did not abandon the cities and go live in the jungle like a hermit. He lived in the heart of one of the most crowded, polluted cities in the world, Mexico City. He didn't want to be there. It's not a pleasant place to be. He was there to serve and help people, to serve humanity and fulfill his mission. What he meant by return to nature is psychological. It's spiritual. So yeah, we should take vacations. We should take retreats. We should, whenever we get a chance, go to the countryside, go to the mountains, go to the beaches, and get away from the city and appreciate nature and be nourished and fed. That gives you so much food for your soul to get that influence. But it doesn't mean that you have to abandon the cities and go live in a cave. That age passed. The need for that type of lifestyle it was in the Piscean era that passed. And now we have an era of the Aquarian age, which is an area of fraternity, where we have to work together and help each other and be together. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's in the city. That's where everybody is. So we need to be there. We need to help each other. So yeah, take a vacation, but come back. Yeah, and that's great. If you have the ability to go and live for a, a few years out and live with the natives, then do, you should do it. I don't. It's hard to survive that way. Very difficult. So instead of going to the natives, you should go on retreats. We have yeah. to remember, too, that there are, there are plenty of groups and organizations in the city, you know, farmers markets, and people try, you know, working in the parks, you know, conserving the nature that we do have in the city. Yeah, there are a lot of resources now that you can you can change your diet and your lifestyle, and there are tools. There is there is awareness of it, and there are resources you can take advantage of. It's true, but again, the main most important thing is to change psychologically. To change psychologically, not your physical habits as much. Change your mind. Change how you look at things and how you think about things. That's what's most important. It's not to go home and throw out all your plastic. That's fine if you want to, but it's not going to make any difference to your soul. Your soul needs other things. Next week. Yeah, there will be no lecture next week. Uh, there's a break. So be aware of that. So that's all. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.